all I'm doing as I go through this, so let's go ahead and expand those, is that I am effectively calculating values at each point in time. The next part of my equation, it says for both the real cosine term and the imaginary sine term, I need to sum those up over all time because this is a definite integral from minus infinity to infinity and integrals mean we sum everything up and so we find the area under the curve for all t. Once I've done that I just need to multiply by delta t the time step that I take which of course in real integration goes to zero and what this is going to give me since I'm doing a definite integral for both the real part and the imaginary part is after I go through all of this, I'm going to have a value of f of omega, the value I chose, that has a real part and an imaginary part. The next thing I'm going to do in my algorithm is I'm going to go to the next frequency I want to calculate. I'm going to increment omega. I ask, is this the last frequency I want to calculate? Well, since I've only done one, it's no. I go back at the new value of omega, omega sub 2 here, we go through the, exactly the same process. We take the product, we integrate, we multiply by delta t, and we come up with a complex number that has a real and imaginary part at that omega. We go to the next omega, we multiply, we integrate, we multiply by delta t, come up with another complex number. So by going through this step, by multiplying and integrating, we end up for each frequency we choose with essentially a complex number. And when we're done, we simply exit our algorithm and what we get is f of omega that tells us the amplitude of the real part is a function of frequency and an imaginary part which is the amplitude of the sine part as a function of frequency. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like. I've gone ahead and calculated essentially the product and I've shaded in the product of f of t and sine and f of t and cosine so you can see what the integrals look like for my function. Remember my functions a, a sine term at 3 hertz and a cosine term at 8 hertz. So let's go ahead and see what we get. I'm taking my function f of t and I'm multiplying it by the cosine, the real part, at my cosine frequency 3 hertz. When I do that, look at what I see. The product of the function has an area that's positive here, negative positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, so on and so forth, negative, positive. And if I were to do the integral, if I were to sum up this function over all of time, the positive parts and the negative parts are going to cancel out and the integral is going to be pretty close to zero. Because with the function I've defined, which is remember 0.6 sine of 3 hertz, plus 0.8 cosine of 8 hertz at a frequency f equal 3 hertz there is no sine component so I would expect to get zero however if we look at this function multiplied by the sine at 3 hertz I get positive positive there's a small negative positive positive negative positive you see how it goes the positive parts far outweigh the negative parts and while the integral here is equal to zero, the integral down here gives me a number that's greater than zero. In fact, there is some sine component to this function. That's what the Fourier transform is telling me. Let's look at something at a different frequency, at 5 hertz, that the function doesn't have in it. If we look at a 5 hertz overlap between our function, we get negative, negative, positive, positive. I don't have to go through this. You can see that the integral of this is going to sum to zero. The sine term looks like it's equally balanced on positive and negative, and the integral of the sine term is also going to be 0 at 5 hertz because there is no 5 hertz component in our function. However, we go on and look at 8 hertz, where we know there's a cosine term. We get positive, positive, positive. This is greater than 0 when we do the integral. If I look at the sine term, this is approximately equal to 0. I can see that just by looking at the fact that the positive and negative components value. Or, or basically cancel out. Whew. So what are we saying here? We're saying simply by multiplying the function by the sine and cosine terms, real and imaginary, 
where we keep changing the frequency, we can get how much of that sine wave is in any arbitrary function. We can go on and look at what happens when our frequency is 30 hertz, much larger than any kind of oscillation of our function, and you'll see that we continue to get zero for both the real and imaginary parts unless there happens to be a component of the function that has that kind of sine wave in it. This really couldn't be any simpler. The Fourier transform is a very simple thing when you get down to it and, and look at it as an algorithm. So again, one more time as we go through this. We start with some frequency. We multiply, step two, our function by a sine wave at our frequency. We sum up over all time and say, does the function, does the product of the function and the sine wave be mainly positive, mainly negative, or does it add to zero? We scale things by multiplying by our time step. We get, essentially, for every frequency, a complex number, which we store away as our frequency domain representation, go on to the next frequency, and loop through this for all the frequencies we're interested in, and at the end, we essentially get the amplitude of the cosine terms as the real part, and the amplitude of the sine terms as the imaginary part. And that's what the Fourier transform gives us. Um, let's look at a square wave. We happen to know that, that uh, square waves um, have sinusoidal components in them. You know, we get negative, 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 negative. Uh, definitely at 3 hertz, uh, this particular sine wave matches up well with the square wave, so the integral is going to be less than 0. Positive, negative, positive, the positives outweigh. So the imaginary part of the integral is going to be greater than zero here. But if we go instead to some other frequency, say uh, 6 hertz, um, you'll notice the integrals are going to be zero. There is not a 6 hertz component in a 3 hertz square wave. And if you go and do your signal theory, you'll find out that that is in fact true. Um, so to review, the Fourier transform looking at it algorithmically gives us the frequency domain representation or the amplitudes of the sine and cosine terms, real and imaginary parts that make up this function. Um, we can represent, remember, sine waves as real and imaginary or magnitude and phase. Uh, the magnitude and phase, particularly magnitude, I think is the most useful representation um, since it tells you how much of that frequency component is present and Fourier transforms, except in your classes, are almost always done with computers. Uh, there's very powerful programs out there that will do Fourier transforms almost instantaneously. So these things are quite simple to do without having to go through an immense amount of math if you have any kind of programming skill at all. Um, so to conclude, let's look essentially at the Fourier transform of a sine wave at 40 hertz. If I look at the real and imaginary part, the real part shown in green here, the imaginary part is shown in red, and if I look at the Fourier transform, I see that essentially there is very little frequency component or close to zero for any frequency except those right near 40 hertz. If I look at the magnitude in dark blue and the phase term in light blue, I see the same thing. My magnitude term particularly tells me that for this function, there's very little frequencies except those at 40 hertz. We can look at more complicated functions, of course. Here's a function called a double Gaussian. So if f of t has this type of shape, the real and imaginary parts are shown in this graph right here. Again, real is green, imaginary is red. And the magnitude is shown in dark blue, the phase in light blue. And you can see that, that using computers, you can really look at the frequency components of practically any type of system using the Fourier transform. Hopefully you understand Fourier transforms a little bit better. They're not so scary anymore. And you really understand how they work by looking at it in an algorithmic fashion.